Mm. Um, but I think coming into politics, I became much more interested in the development challenge of Ghana and also for the continent. Mm. Um, and that was the thrust of my book, the, the challenges Africa has faced in its development and where we are to date. Wow. This is not Ghana. Africa. It's not Ghana. I would like to see. Is it ready? Is it out? It's ready, but it's not been published. Um, wow. Yeah. We did research in... I'll just give you one example from the book. We did research on 36 African countries, mm. just finding out what is going on in the media and what Africans are saying. Mm. And the results were very interesting. Wow. 45 to 55% of the media discourse in Africa is on politics. 45 to 55%. 55%. You have another... Um, 25 to 35 focusing on um, religion. You have another 15 wow. to 7 percent focusing on sports. Okay. And then you have about 6 percent focusing on development. Seriously? Yes. Is this SSA or includes North Africa? It's Sub Saharan Africa, including wow. South Africa. Then wow. what we did in the book was that we mapped that against China in its development cycle, mm. just to see where we were in ours. Because you know, the Bible says that as a man thinketh, so is he. Mm. So what we found out was in China's development cycle, their media was so much focused on development. So you would go through a normal news broadcast and the conversation would be on a factory that had produced the one millionth tractor and it had improved by 36 percent efficiency mm. it could double the yield of acres plowed in maybe half the time etc and then they would show all the engineers that had worked on the project I see. so you could see that the average chinese person who's been who's done their development in my lifetime things on how to make things and things on how to achieve things so you think that chinese media has helped their development more than the african media i think what you focus on is what you become. Wow. So you see a lot of people are interested in politics today. If you talk to young people, a lot of them are interested in getting into politics or mm. becoming a pastor or a priest or a sports person. That is what we have become as a nation because everybody is oriented towards what they hear. And what I learned from that experience is that in reality, we haven't started yet focusing on our development as a continent. Oh, interesting. Yeah. We'll come back to this. Were you at the manifesto launch? I was. Did you, were you part of the team that put this together? Look, first of all, this manifesto was done by the people of Ghana for the people of Ghana. NDC practically facilitated it. And the, the chairman of the manifesto committee, the secretary, um, all the key members on the team mm. put in a lot of hard work and a lot of good work. His Excellency the President was also heavily involved in its composition. Mm. So, so what role did you play? This is, oh, we shared some ideas. Um, I think that's pretty much how much how our involvement was. We shared some ideas, we read through some of the mm. um, scripts and so on and so forth. I mean, it, it looks like a compendium of promises. <laughs> It is what the people of Ghana are asking for from their political leaders. Really? So that is what it is. Is that not the tail wagging the dog? Because if you have a developmental state like Ghana and you want to come and do what the people of Ghana say they want, so you list well, it's two things. Two thousand things you do for them and then they vote for you. It's is that two how things. it's done? It's not the tail wagging the dog. It's actually the head listening to the rest of the body, which is how it should be. Mm. Because if you want to lead a people, you must understand not only who they are, you must also understand where they are. And then you must have a vision that articulates of where we would all like to go and where we would all like to be. Mm. And that's what this manifesto en is en cap uh, captures. Now, th there's, a, there's a lot of items and things in the manifesto. But the key, I think, within the manifesto is to look at where it came from. And I think our General Secretary, Asif Nketiah, made a very uh, interesting remark when he was delivering his speech at the manifesto launch, where he gave the example of how when the Fourth Republican Constitution was being written, His Excellency the President, uh, former President Rawlings, insisted that the Constitution be written 
by listening and consulting with the ordinary people and the mass people of this country. All the previous constitutions that had been written before didn't last three or four or five years, simply because it was done by intellectuals, people who, are, who have arrogated upon themselves the right to rule a country, mm. whereas the people also had their own idea. Now, also, it's also very important, Bernard, to make at this point that Ghana has evolved. Mm. We've gone from being a country of 3 million people to being a country of 30 million people. We've gone from a country where education penetration was probably about 6% to where it is um, above 60% today. So what you would do in the 60s, in the 70s, is not what you would do in the 90s and in the 20s, because more universities have been built, more mm. people have attended school. Most interesting today, the social media. So you can have a Ghanaian living in some part of the country and he or she is able to understand what's happening within the rest of the world. So you've really got to approach the Ghanaian as if he's intelligent, mm. he's smart, and he or she knows what they want out of life. And that is what the People's Manifesto is about. Did the NDC um, explain to Ghanaians and admit the errors that led to Mr. Mohammed's defeat? I'm asking this because I, I, I watched you being interviewed in 2016. You seemed pretty <laughs> confident that Mahama was going to win. And because you, in fact, I remember the host of the show asking you a question that the MPP wanted to do something. And you said, oh, you had already started doing it. You said you already started, I think it was refining our crude or something. Yes. You sounded so confident. Some would yes. even say it was cocky. So confident that you were going to win. And then you quoted a scripture that said, oh, is it Mark 4, 23 or 3 something that a house divided against us was not going to stand? Less than two months later, you lost by over a million votes. Yes, and it was a catastrophic experience for most of us. What does that say about your sense of reality well, at what, the time? What it says is that the party that is able to have the courage to walk into opposition is that same party is the party that is going to have the courage to walk back into government. Because opposition, in my book, is purgatory. It's not hell. You go back. <laughs> you believe in purgatory. Oh, I believe I'm a Catholic. Oh, okay. Born and raised. <laughs> okay. So you have a situation where the NDC had to go back and consider mm -hmm. what went wrong. And the reality is that our party has always been based on listening to what the ordinary people of Ghana want. Mm. And the result and the culmination of three and a half years in opposition is the People's Manifesto. Some of your spokespersons have said the MPP promised their way into power. I'm being charitable. Some even say they lied their way into power. Some mm -hmm. of your people who come on this show. Yes. So essentially saying that MPP just came to promise a compendium of things and they deceived Galibo Ghanaians to vote for them. And you seem to be doing the same thing because you're promising a lot of things. In fact, even within education, you promise about four free things just in secondary. So I'm asking how different, if that premise is true, because you haven't even told me why you lost. If that premise is true, is this an attempt to give Ghanaian voters what they want so they just vote for you? No, it is not. Because what we've also learned is that it's very dangerous to overpromise and not deliver. Because the Ghanaian is intelligent. He's not stupid. Hmm. The challenge that the current government is having is the ability to have... I mean, it's almost four years. Hmm. And the people of Ghana are looking at what they said they were going to do and comparing it with what they have done. Mm -hmm. And that is a major challenge that you don't want to get in if you are in a party involved in national development. And the NDC has not done that. The NDC has gone to the people. We have listened to them. We have gone way back. I mean, this manifesto, um, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. You remember His Excellency, the President, when he was delivering his opening remarks? Yeah raised a number of issues. You are referring to the former president? The former president, uh, John, John Mohammed. Yes, okay, yes. just to be clear. Just to be clear. Yeah. He raised a couple of issues in his, in his introduction. He talked about poverty and how it is a scourge mm -hmm. and how it must be dealt with. He talked about Ghanaian ownership of the economy. Now, just to give you a bit of a background as to how far NDC went in our thinking before we arrived at this. In the 70s and the 80s, when you smoked a cigarette, it was made in Ghana. When you went to a bank to borrow money, it was more than likely a Ghanaian bank, state bank. 
when you mined gold in this country, 75% of the gold mined was done by Ghanaian companies, i.e. the state gold mining company. When you sat on a plane, it was mostly Ghana Airways. So if you look at Ghanaian uh, contribution to the economy, or GNP as a percentage of GDP, it was about 70%, 71 to 72%. Ghana has a country, has done three things since we went into the economic recovery program and the structural adjustment program. We have focused on macroeconomic stability. We have focused on that driven by foreign direct investment mm -hmm. and poverty alleviation programs. Macro the, stability. Macroeconomic stability. FDI. FDIs and poverty, poverty alleviation, alleviation programs. programs. Every government from um, the PNDC all the way down to has had these issues strong in their... Yes, uh, that, 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 that is, is correct. Yes. The resultant effect of that is Ghanaian ownership of our economy today has fallen from that high of 72% to somewhere in the low 30s, uh, high 20s. So when you see a finance minister come and stand on TV and talk about how the economy is growing, and they always make a reference to GDP growth. We as Ghanaians don't feel it in our pocket, and it has created a certain breach of trust between the politicians and the people, because you can't keep saying that this economy is growing, and the average Ghanaian keeps getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed out of the economy. The manifesto has raised some very key objectives mm. that we believe that as a matter of policy, we want to have Ghanaian ownership of the economy grow to about 55%. Because if you don't achieve that, then you are looking at a national security issue. Because the problem of this country is poverty. Now, Paul, uh, this, is key for, this is key for me to explain. I was driving around the country in the last year and a half since I've been back. And I've engaged with many people. And one of the things that I've heard people say in fact, I don't know if your producer can get it up, but there was a picture of me and some engagements I had. There's this woman I met in a town in Where? the Afram Plains. You went to Afram Plains? I went to the Afram Plains. And they were telling me that... To all, do what? Was this a tour as a... Because you're a businessman. Or are you, were you campaigning? What were you doing? Just to, to be sure. I was doing both. I was listening to Ghanaians and I was monitoring... Is, the, this, is it a woman? Yes, that, those are the people. Yes. You were interviewing we, her yourself? No, we were doing a Under the Tree Palaba discussion about the situation that they face. Wow. These two women or these two ladies are saying that mm -hmm. they are tired of being poor. Mm -hmm. They burn charcoal and that is how they make their living. And so when we were talking to them about uh, free SHS, etc., etc., they like it, but they also want to be wealthy. They want to have a decent life. So the issues of what governments have been doing with regard to focusing on poverty alleviation you can do that when you are 3 million people. You can do that when you are 6 million people. At 30 million people, if 60% of your population and thereabouts is poor, there is no amount of revenue you can generate to but, manage their poverty. But two, two things. Mm -hmm. The MPP has implemented pro-poor policies. And they introduced the capitation grant, mm -hmm. which improved access at the basic level to education. Mm -hmm. He also introduced school feeding program. Correct. Where, because of poverty, parents who used to send their kids to farm, send their kids to school. Correct. We saw the report. Yes. Now, Naku Fado has introduced free SHS. Yes. These are pro-poor policies, yes. which even ideologically are supposed to be done by your party. <laughs> yes. So if you come and tell me that there's poverty in the country, and in our fourth republic, NDC has been in power for a longer time. MPP has had eight years plus three. You've had 92 to 2000. No, NDC, yes. not PNDC. NDC and the PNDC yes. are two different entities, yes. and they ruled under yes, two from different... Yes, from 93 to 2000 is NDC. Yes, in. correct. And then you also did Mills Mahama. Correct. So you've done two eight-year terms, 16 years. So you can't tell me that poverty. See, it's a good... What it's are a you good, saying? It's a good question. And... One of the things that I want to say about this manifesto, every era has its issue and has its challenges. Mm. So, for example, in 2012, the defining mm. issue was power. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the government then's effort went into uh, solving the power crisis. Mm -hmm. If you came to 2017, there was no power crisis. So the government of uh, President Akufuado has not had to de de fo focus on that. The point is this manifesto is focusing on where we are as a country 
in this point in time. Now, I'm going to come actually back to the question that you're asking about what is this about poverty. Mm -hmm. Ghana has transitioned from a planned economy to a mixed economy into a free market economy. Mm -hmm. In a free market economy, you need five things. And it is these five things go into what is referred to as an enabling environment. Mm -hmm. So when governments and politicians say our job is not to create jobs, but to create an enabling environment, yeah. they're talking about five things. Mm -hmm. Number one is human capital. So every government in this country has focused on human capital, which is primarily education, knowledge, training, and skills. Mm -hmm. The second is social capital, which is who you know or who knows you. It's a very legitimate form of capital because that is what gives people access mm. to ideas to, uh, 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 to op and to opportunities. The third form of capital is your natural resource capital. Ghana and Ghanaians are endowed with tons and tons of that natural resource capital. Mm -hmm. Our lakes, our rivers, Good. our land, our ocean for fishing and all of that. Good. The fourth one is your environmental capital, which, you, which is loosely translated as the opportunities available to you. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a guy like a company called Coco King, yes. came, looked at the Ghanaian environment, realized that it had moved on, a lot of small families um, rushing to work in the morning with the kids going to mm -hmm. school, may not have time because they live very far to make breakfast. So he started, he saw an, an opportunity in an economic environment, and he created a business out of that. Mm -hmm. The fifth one is financial capital. Mm. And that is where our country has not been able to deliver for our citizens. And if you look at capital, how Ghanaians have formed capital in the last 30 or so odd years, it's been primarily in three ways. The most, imp the most uh, common way have been people leaving the country at the age of 20 or 25, migrate to Europe or America, and they spend the first five years settling down getting their papers <laughs> and all of that. Interesting. Then they spend another five years settling down, having a family and kids. They come and buy a piece of land in Ghana. So that's 10 years. He's managed to acquire a piece of land. Then he spends another five years. He'll probably build a house up to Lintel. That's 15 years. If he was 25 years old, he's now uh, 40 years old. Okay? Mm. Then he spends another five years to finish the house and probably buy um, some furnishings and so on and so forth. That's 20 years. Then the gentleman or the family would now spend the last five years moving back to Ghana. They would have decided the business they want to do. Mm. They would have bought the cars they want to live in and all of that. So the average Ghanaian has been taking 20 to 25 years to get what is called capital to be able to um, live their dreams. This is financial capital. Financial capital because they would have developed their human capital and all those other skills. So if you are trying to develop an economy, you cannot develop the country without developing the citizens. So the schools are good, the hospitals are good, the roads are good. But when a man has an idea and he can't have an environment within which he finances those ideas, then he, becomes, he or she becomes frustrated. So if you listen to all the young people in Ghana today, mm. the shout is for jobs and for opportunity. Because if our state cannot provide a certain environment, now let's go back to the so-called good old days of Ghanaian entrepreneurs and capitalism. You talk about the JKCLs, the BAMSs, the Kwabna Usus, and so on and so forth. They had NIB. They had ADB. They had a Merchant Bank. They had state-owned institutions that were ready to support Ghanaian um, individuals with capital and long-term capital to be able to grow their businesses. So what is the NDC's uh, let me plan based on the manifesto? I will come to, to that. To, we don't have all day. I just want to be sure. I've, you've built a point. Okay. Capital With, formation is within the manifesto, a difficult problem. I think on page 30F, um, mm -hmm. we've, we talk about the banking crisis. Because the banking crisis, and I have to put that in, the, in this context. Mm -hmm. The banking crisis has affected the Ghanaian banks within the SME space that lend to Ghanaians. Okay? So if you're a Ghanaian businessman before and you're a Ghanaian businessman today, there's a huge difference in terms of your opportunity to access capital. And you can see that in the drop in volume 
of the business of ports, uh, activity at the ports, and so on and so forth. And it started way back in 2018. It wasn't a function of really? COVID. Yes. The, 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 the no, no, lending no. to Ghanaian, lending has not been, I, I, the, the issue of lending to private sector from the banks predates the COVID. -O. It's always been an issue. No, but that's the point I'm making. I'm only talking about the SMEs. Okay. Who are not, I mean, that's what I'm saying, the Ghanaians, the small Ghanaian middle class that we had, was playing within the indigenous Ghanaian banking sector uh -huh. because the multinational banks lend to multinationals. Yeah. They don't lend to Ghanaians. And obviously, they are using Ghanaian deposits to lend to foreign companies. That's mm. been one of the features of our economy because, you know, apart from your capital, is your deposits that you use to actually do business. So you have a situation today where NDC has, made, has recognized that MFIs, savings and loans, um, indigenous banks have been pushed out of the system and therefore the average Ghanaian is struggling to access capital. I was watching the news when I came here today and I saw this struggle between the Nigerian traders and, and mm -hmm. Ghanaian traders. The major, one of the major causes underlying that is very simple. In the 2000s, we brought in a lot of Nigerian banks into the Ghanaian economy. And that was a good thing, because it's good to diversify your financial sector service base. But the minute the Ghanaian traders fell out, the Ghanaian banking system, indigenous banking system fell out, you see that the Nigerian traders, by virtue of their links in Nigeria, I, most of them would have, for example, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example, an uncle doing business in nails, selling in Sokoto. He's doing 100 containers a month because of the size of the Nigerian economy. He has a nephew and he says, go to Ghana and start a business. He goes to UBA Bank mm -hmm. and guarantees that nephew at UBA Bank with his balance sheet and his business in Nigeria. That gentleman comes to Ghana, he has access to capital, and he's, he's now able to trade. The Ghanaian businessman who was doing business with UT Bank or uh, Unibank or some other bank, all of a sudden has a credit squeeze. So in terms of the ability of to do business, even though the gentleman from Nigeria is not necessarily within Ghana, he has a bigger advantage. But the public no, sector I involvement in our banking sector has increased. So even though seven banks sort of disappeared into, the first two became a bigger GCB, there's now consolidated as well, there's ADB still there, there's NIB still there. So you have four state-controlled banks. You are saying you want to build a regional development finance institution, yes. presumably state-owned, right? But you already have GCB, you have... There are two things there. GCB and the regular commercial banks. ADB, ADB NIB, all of them. Consolidated bank. They are operating as universal banks. Uh-huh. Universal banks run on Basel II, mm -hmm. okay? Basel, as a banking regulatory system, has many features and many factors, but I'll just talk about two of them. One, it was designed for industrialized societies, which have just-in-time stocks. Mm. Um, and therefore, their cash conversion cycles are 90 days, maybe 180 days. Uh -huh. They also were designed to give European countries and Western industrialized countries an average of 3 to 5% growth, okay? Now, Ghana is an agrarian society. If it's cocoa that you are going to plant, it takes three years before you can get your first harvest. That is why there are no uh, universal banks financing agriculture because the structure of the regulation within which they sit does not allow them to invest in development. Before that, we had developmental banking mm -hmm. in our banking regulation mm -hmm. until I think it was in 2004 mm. uh, where the Kufo administration created a universal banking uh, regulation. Mm -hmm. And that is what has created the situation where we realize that we need institutions that are focused at development finance. But MPP promised a development bank. And I think they gave an update in their manifesto. Look, the, the, I think the plan was to merge NIB and ADB. First of all, 
to have a development bank, you need to have regulation for that. There's no regulation for that. In their manifesto, they are pursuing the normal universal banking approach. But if you want to have development financial institutions, you have to have Bank of Ghana focus on a different style of regulation. The NDC set up the Exim Bank, mm -hmm. and that was supposed to finance uh, export-oriented uh, type of activities. Mm -hmm. But if you go back into our history, what we are saying is not new. It's been done before. I'm sure you remember Voradep, Norip, Redikash, Eredek. Mm -hmm. Voradep is the Volta Regional Development Corporation. Uh, Redikash is the Regional Development Corporation of Ashanti. Mm -hmm. Eredek is the Eastern Regional uh, mm -hmm. Development Company. I know Voradep Football Club and Eredek Hotel. <laughs> So I'm sure they are from the same source. So at the time, you didn't have many Ghanaians that were entrepreneurial. So government decided they would focus on development, uh, um, development, focus on development on a regional specific basis. Mm -hmm. Because there are certain, for example, crops like, cash, uh, like cashew or like uh, shea, which are indigenous to different parts of the country versus cocoa, mm. you know. Now, if you want to focus on how you build this country, you've got to be able to get access to credit, give your citizens access to credit in the regions in where they live and the opportunities. Which is why you are, you are thinking of a regional development On bank. a regional basis. I'll take a break and come back and es explore that. I want to talk about industrialization because uh, Mr. Wadaku seems to think that he has, or the NDC has a plan to industrialize, which will be better than the 1D1F, which we are told has uh, spawned Almost a hundred factories. This is the point of view. We're chatting to come here. Wadako, former boss and tour MD, uh, will come back right after they stay with us. a little before getting pregnant again stop worrying and live free no matter who you are Lydia has a contraceptive just for you choose the Lydia daily contraceptive pill with iron as your regular contraceptive or the Lydia IUD a non-hormonal contraceptive for long-term pregnancy prevention contact the Lydia contact center and let us help you decide how to live free with Lydia you truly decide. It's not long ago that things were normal. Good friends could meet for a good drink and share good times. And then everything changed. And our bars, the center of our communities, all closed, sending us all indoors. But now, things are changing. Kakra, kakra. Small, small. We're getting our lives back. Obey ye. We'll get back to the way things were. Hey, mama. Hey, you want a drink? Yeah, man. It's time for us to rise up. Hey, you back. Oh, you As we look forward to making our bars safe, Guinness Ghana will invest 10 million CDs through the Union and Boom program to get our bar owners back on their feet. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Welcome back to the point of view. We're chatting to Kwame Wada who used to run tour and bust. I wonder how he did that. <laughs> Was it even legal to run two institutions at the time? Was it? Did you have any legal problems running Boston Tour? I did not. I, because I, I was given additional responsibility as the MD for Tema Oil Refinery. So um, I wasn't even drawing two salaries. 
I was only you drawing one salary. I was only drawing one salary from Boston. I never took a penny from Temawa. I remember you, you held a church service wearing white. That you attend tour around. Which we did. Really? I mean, the reality is that when I got to Temawa Refinery, we had no refining activity going. The tank farm mm. was overgrown, and you had snakes, stray dogs, and stray cats. If you sent a worker to go into the tank farm, they were refusing to go. We couldn't pay for electricity. And our lights were being shut off uh, all the time. You will also remember that things were so bad that the workers of Tor gave up their salaries for two months to enable us to uh, put the company's uh, finances in the short term together. That is the tour I went to meet. Really? The tour I left had gone from 25,000 barrels a day to 45,000 barrels a day. Tor had paid off. We had restructured 350 million out of the 650 million tour debt that I went to meet. Um, we had, in, we were started processing 10 crude oil. Really? And yes, we had, and I mean, it was... But you took over tour July 2015. Correct. Having done boss from October 2013. I have the state ownership report for 2017. Mm -hmm. Revenue for tour 2015, 257 million. Actually dipped in 2016, 248. And in 2017, further dipped to 212. Net profit, loss of 470 million 2015, loss of 511 million 2016, yeah. loss of 365 2017. So, the first thing so how you, is this a turnaround? So the first thing you've got to realize is 2015, I had six months to get the mindset of the workers and to refocus the organization. So we did an organizational restructuring and, and all that. We started refining on the 4th of February 2016. Now we had a model where Tor was tolling for crude oil for Bost. Mm. And as a result of that, um, the, there was, the, it was, Tor wasn't engaged in a commercial operation of the crude oil trading. It was just focusing on the processing. Mm. Tor was making $4.5 every barrel, and we told 7 million barrels. That was nice, clean income with no price fluctuation or exposure to term oil refinery. So if you look at that, it was the first time that Tor had stable income for a period. Now, when you see the uh, net figure you are talking about, you should go and look at the top line to see the operational income. Because on an operational basis, we made a profit. But if you've inherited debts, if you've inherited a huge hole, that profit goes under the bottom line to create, um, that's where you see that the losses were falling but focus on the top line, which is where my own activities... But I'm just even the revenue dipped from 2015 to 2016, revenue came down. So for a company that hasn't refined and you're refining, I, revenue I, is top I, of the top line. I will, I will challenge the... It's here. I will challenge that. I have it here. This is your state ownership report. 2015, uh, 257 million. 2016, 248 million. 2017, I, 212 million. I doubt those figures. Well, this is your state ownership report, page 55. You can check it, unless I, they made a mistake. I, I will go and check, but I doubt those figures. I know what we did and what we left behind. So what was your revenue for 2016? Um, Tor's revenue for 2016 would be... Um, it would be something in excess of... about $45 million. $45 million. Translating, I've, this is in CDs, by the way. I think we had an exchange rate of about four. Forty-five million dollars. Yeah, Forty-five. No, actually, it's more than that. Yeah, it's about five million dollars. Yeah. Even if it's, if it's, even if it's five. Yeah. Four, five, twenty. There you have it. Two fifty-seven. Two forty-eight. And what was the revenue in the previous year? I have only twenty fifteen is two fifty-seven. Twenty sixteen is two forty-eight. 2017 is 212, so it's coming down. This is revenue. Okay, You're I saying I shouldn't look I at net profit. I wasn't responsible for 2017. Um, and 20. But you left in end of 2016. I okay, left. Okay, yes. yes. So end of year. So you yeah. are responsible for 2015, 2016. Yeah. And revenue was coming down. Well, it was real cash. It was real revenue. It was real income. I don't know. As what, against what? There's so many ways. Look, that company's debt overhang when I walked in was about 650 million. I don't know what debt position you have over there. Uh, in total liabilities, 2.8 billion. Mm -hmm. In 2016, 3.3 billion. Now 2017, 3.0. So it came down from 2016 to 2017. There's something wrong with the numbers. 
I don't want to dwell on that. I think we should focus on... To be fair, your current liabilities, yes. 2.4 billion 2015, mm -hmm. came down to 1.9 billion Correct. 2016. Correct. And then 1.8 billion 2017. So it went up again. No, it came down. So yeah. 2.4 billion 2015 yeah. comes down to 1.9 billion. Yeah. So what's happening to Thor now? I have no idea. I saw an article in the newspaper. You have no idea. You used to run Thor for <laughs> <laughs> You have no idea. You know, there's a tradition in How? Thor. Okay. Every, there's no managing director in Thor who has left, who has actually ever returned back to the refinery. Why? It's a tradition. But you, are, you should be interested. You're talking about poverty elevation. You are here saying NDC wants to do this and that and the other. You don't what, even know what what's happening to talk. I know they are not refining. That's, the, that's number one. I know they've tried to refine a few times. And wow. they've made some losses. But I don't know the details. So I don't want to... Is it because there were allegations of some kind against you when you left? No. No. What's the, stat are you, have you, have, what, what's the status of, of that? Look, I had, I don't know, Canada Japan was saying that uh, $300 million is missing in Bost, $200 million had been traced to an account of mine. I sued him. I think we're still in court for that. I haven't been charged with any theft or anything of that nature. What's the status of the suit? Um, honestly speaking, I haven't been aggressively following it because... Was you suing for 5 million CDs? Yes, I did. If I sue somebody <laughs> for 5 million, I'll be, I'll be following him. Oh, oh. You, don't, you don't need the money. I, I'm not driven by money. Now, if somebody's damaged your reputation and you sued him, you should. I think for him. me, most important is for that right to be that wrong to be put right. Have because you been cleared? Have I been cleared of what? Of allegations made against you. Well, allegations are not uh, charges. So, if you if you make an allegation against somebody, basically, I have not been. I've gone through a process, and I know I don't have any outstanding issues with any of the authorities in the country. Okay. Yeah. So Ioko hasn't written to you to say they're investigating you or anything like this? Oh, Ioko did investigate me, but they have finished their investigation. And did they show you the final report? I have seen it, yes. And what does the report say about you? Um, I think the best people to answer what that says is Ioko. Because but there they... are no processes after that? No. So your no assumption processes. is that you are okay? No, I read the report. And what did he say? I'm fine. <laughs> what is your okay so let's come back to this so fine two things development bank now i wanted to read something to you you said you want to do this is page 30 right yes you re, you said that uh, one of the things ndc would do where is page 30 we'll uh, focus on getting capital to regional development finance institutions or banks it's not the credit. only mechanism there's the mass I, I wanted to, to show you something yeah. the uh national development bank I'm told there's already a bill passed on this. Yes, there is, yes. It's in parliament. I don't know if it's been passed. So that's what I'm asking. So is end, end, your, 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 the difference is that yours is regional. Look, NDC, MPP has an idea. Um, you can read what they've said there. But yeah, you can read it. The National Development Bank is expected to be an independent institution that will be globally rated to enable to leverage foreign private capital for industrial and agricultural development in a country. This was announced by Finance Minister Ken Oforiata okay. during points. the budget 2020. Two points. Yeah. The words in there are foreign capital. Yes. We believe that as much as foreign capital is encouraged in the country, we must not put it in a situation where it disenfranchises Ghanaians from participating in their economy. Because mm. if you look at the banking subsystem today, before a credit is made, the decision is made in Lagos, it's made in Johannesburg, it's made in Morocco, it's made in Paris, and I think maybe it's made in Brussels. So you have a situation where you cannot continue to take development of Ghana because capital is a key factor or a key driver of, econo of, of economic mm -hmm. development. You cannot continue to take the decisions away from Ghanaians, away from Ghana. So our idea is we need to have a situation where Ghanaians are forming domestic capital. How are you going to do that? Two areas. I mean, several areas. But the, one of the main areas is, for example, cocoa. Uh -huh. I think we've made a, <clears throat> a point that we want cocoa. to process at least 50% of uh, cocoa um, produced in the country. Yeah. I think that's on yes. <clears throat> page 35. Yes. Cocoa processing for value addition and jobs. The NDC government will ensure the presence of at least 50% of cocoa beans locally before export. 
Where, so when you say process into cocoa paste, cocoa what? So you have a number of uh, stages in the processing uh, process. So you can go to nibs, you can go to cocoa liquor, you can go to cocoa butter and cocoa powder. <clears throat> now and you are going to, this is half, at least half. Within what period? I think we will, first of all, to set up your processing plants and get cocoa marketing company to stop just marketing raw beans, but to also offer cocoa paste, cocoa liquor, and cocoa nibs and cocoa butter as part of its offerings is important because you can't be a raw material producer for the rest of your life. And since Tetequashi came and taught us how to farm cocoa and how to produce cocoa, mm. we haven't had a structured way of evolving the farmer along the supply chain. Now, let me give you two points about how we want to do it, which is different. Mm -hmm. We want to bring, and again, this is talking to the people and the people's manifesto. Okay. Ghanaians are tired of poverty. I keep hearing the word poor cocoa farmer, poor cocoa farmer, poor cocoa farmer. It's not going to get our young people into farming if we keep our farmers poor. So our model is saying that, look at the value of the raw bean. Mm -hmm. which today is about 8,600 CDs a ton. Mm -hmm. That's what is paid to the farmer. Uh -huh. If you go to what the Cocoa Board receives, you are looking at 12,400 CDs a ton. So the difference between what the government takes from the farmer is about 4,000 CDs a ton. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when you process from beans to nibs and from nibs into the various uh, components, Let's say that you can go from a value, the, the raw value of times one to at least times three. So if you create a situation where what we are thinking of doing is have processing, cocoa processing plants within the various key cocoa growing districts. You are a farmer and you take your beans to the, today you bag your beans and you take it to the warehouse. It's weighed and an amount of money is given to you. You now go from there, where you take your beans, to the processing plant. Now, that processing plant will be a tolling plant. A tolling plant? Yes. You are, you are borrowing the toll tolling. <laughs> it's, a, it's a commercial model that is used in coal yeah. and in yeah. other yeah. places. Yeah. There's also a tolling. There's a tolling arrangement. Yes. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. But the point is, you want the farmer to get an increase in income. So if the cocoa pr plant processes and, and pays and the, charges the farmer a, a tolling fee, for argument's sake, then the farmer can go from 8,600 to say, for example, you get to a multiple of times three to um, 24,000 CDs on the basis of the processing or the value added that has been done. So I don't have a large, marketing, I don't have a large processing factories or small medium, medium sized you don't want, so you want for example a processing plant there are 800,000 cocoa growing uh, families or farms in Ghana so if you put for example one per a thousand farms that means you're going to have about within the entire country anything between 500 uh, 400 to um, 800 uh, processing facilities but the idea is to give value and to increase the farmer's income. So who own the plant? It will be a combination of uh, private sector and I think uh, Cocoa, Market, uh, Cocoa Board will also have some influence in that because to be able to get international prices um, for processed cocoa at a certain level, really? one of the things that Cocoa Board has established itself is in is the quality of our beans. So we've got to be able to give that quality assurance in the refined uh, in the in the processed cocoa as well to the international buyers. There are about 80 countries. But you still haven't told me where the money will come from to do this. Already, cocoa board is going every year. They go shopping to get money to even buy cocoa beans, just to buy the beans. So yes. you need to do a syndicated loan. Yes, because and I'm talking about because, processing 50 percent. Because the model is wrong. So where is the money going to come? Let from? me tell you why the model is wrong. Governments use cocoa marketing board or Cocoa Board, as the Forex Bureau mm -hmm. for the country. And that has deprived our farmers of their livelihood and their income. So the focus of, every, of the government is, we're going to do a syndicated loan, put the dollars in Bank of Ghana, pay the cocoa farmer in CDs, and then we now have, our, every year, our cocoa farmers give us 2 billion CDs. Okay. 
if you do your processing and you do your value add, you will move from two billion to six billion. Now, instead of getting the money in one tranche, because you are doing a you are doing a a, a seasonal export, and you know that when you have cocoa beans after three months in the tropics, the beans get moldy and mm -hmm. they, they deteriorate in quality. When you nip them, as in you take the skin off, it can stay for 10 years. So you no longer have the pressure of three months. You have to ship all your cocoa into warehouses in Rotterdam and then let the Dutch do the processing and sell the cocoa paste and the cocoa uh, butter and the cocoa powder to uh, the rest of the market. Cocoa marketing company will now be reorganized. Yes, we will continue to do raw beans exports, but because you can't go to 50% in one day. But we will start focusing on the value add and marketing cocoa powder, cocoa butter, and cocoa liquor, and cocoa nibs okay. to the international market. Take a short break. I'll take his view on the alternative to 1D1F, because the MPP in their manifesto has some interesting things to say about industrialization. We're talking to Kwame Wadako on the NDC's economic plan and on other issues. We haven't spoken about a Japa. <laughs> a Japa deal. We'll be back. Stay with us. This is the beating heart of an African, ready for what is next. And this is the sound of a Ghanaian drum, setting the pace. Together, it creates a seamless rhythm of what is and what is to come. A sense of purpose which says that there is more to the Ghanaian than a dream. Ghana always stands ready and First National Bank is happy to invest, partner and help Ghana to discover more. This is why we are happy to announce our acquisition and subsequent merger with GHL Bank, Ghana's leading provider of mortgage financing. A merger which delivers an opportunity to discover more growth and prosperity for all Ghanaians. Listen to the heart beat to the rhythm of the drums. It is time for Ghanaians to discover more together. First National Bank and GHL Bank come together as First National Bank. How can we help you? And again, stop worrying and live free. No matter who you are, Lydia has a contraceptive just for you. Choose the Lydia Daily Contraceptive Pill with Ion as your regular contraceptive or the Lydia IUD, a non-hormonal contraceptive for long-term pregnancy prevention. Contact the Lydia Contact Center and let us help you decide how to live free. With Lydia, you truly decide. It's not long ago that things were normal. Good friends could meet for a good drink and share good times. It's easy, but... And then everything changed, and our bars, the center of our communities, all closed, sending us all indoors. But now, things are changing. Kakra, kakra, small, small, we're getting our lives back. Obey ye, we'll get back to the way things were. Hey, mama. Hey, you want a drink? Yeah, man. It's time for us to rise up. As we look forward to making our bars safe, Guinness Ghana will invest 10 million CDs through the Union and Boom program to get our bar owners back on their feet. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Welcome back to the point of view. Today, we're not sure whether we are closing that 10 or not, <laughs> but we'll see. Kwame Wada is my guest here. Now, you just said a lot of things about cocoa. I have a story for you, and mm -hmm. almost everything you say, we, we can check it. Ghana now processes 34% of its cocoa. Yes. New data from Ghana's cocoa board, the agency that coordinates the cocoa processing sector, revealed that processing of the commodity from its raw form into other products has increased from 23 to 34%. Ghana's government is projecting to have about 50% of its cocoa processed into refined products, such as chocolate and cocoa. Again, but MPP you has see, already no, said it. But there's a very important distinction. 
Which is? If you have Barry Calibo and all these multinationals establishing in the free zone, mm -hmm. buying cocoa from the farmers at the 8,600 uh, uh, price, you are not making the farmer wealthy. You haven't touched the model. Mm. Don't forget that you are looking at Ghanaian contribution to the economy. The minute that cocoa bean leaves the farmer's hands, mm -hmm. goes to the processing factory in the free zone, and the value added is times five. For example, that times five addition is GDP. It's not GNP. It's not part of the Ghanaian's production because it's foreign capital that so has added about, the value. So are you going to nationalize the economy? Or you keep talking about GDP, GNP. You are not nationalizing the economy, but you are putting the Ghanaian at the center of the economy. You are a government. You are responsible for Ghanaians. Mm. It is your duty to make your people uh, prosperous. You cannot develop a country without developing its citizens. Mm. There is no national development without developing Ghanaians. And that is what we have discovered by listening to Ghanaians. That is the power of the People's Manifesto. It is to make sure that our citizens can take ownership of their economy. But that's what the finance minister wants to do, he says, with the Japa deal. He says we play at the lower ranks of gold. He wants to leverage the royalties. He wants us to create in a Japa a company okay. like... Uh, the, the big gold um, royalty companies in the world, mm -hmm. Wheatons and Co. Look, my thoughts on Japan, I'm just going to be very brief on it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to touch it back to the economy. If you look at the NDC manifesto, mm -hmm. I think it's on page... Uh, we made a very bold statement. And the statement we made was that as at today, as at the end of uh, June, you have a situation where government revenue... Mm -hmm is 155% one, of government revenue pays for wages, salaries, and interest and amortization of our debt. On debt. So if you look at the Ajapa deal, it is because Ghana is broke. It's not about any high idea of trying to play at a certain level. Mm. The government needs money and it needs it today. Because under, under what circumstance do you now start listing your future income? You are listing your future income, which is, a, a last, I think last year was $200 million. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. You are listing that because you can't wait mm. for that. You need the money today. That's what Ajapa is about. So the reality is that there is an economic crisis. We are technically... But hippie. securitization of future flows <clears throat> is not new. You securitize the road toll levy for a loan. They are doing it for equity. So it's the same thing. But you can't... No, if you, put, if you do it as a loan, your debt to GDP thing will be blown. So it's a very intelligent way of borrowing under debt. And you know, in economics, the first rule you are taught is that debt is cheaper than equity. So why are you going for a higher form of capital? De uh, equity capital is the most expensive form of capital. And that's what a Japan but it has to increase our debt stock because you have the people who complain about the debt. But so the, if you go with equity, it means but you're not you've using got to stock. ask yourself why. And you see, there's a very big problem in our society. If you take 2006 to 2008, uh, the Kufour government added nine billion after we left the hippie thing. So let's say we are accumulating debt at the rate of 4.5 billion a year. I'm just going to give average. We have a minute to end and go through quickly. If you look at Mills Mahama, we did uh, 110 billion. So let's say that's average of 14 billion uh, cities of debt addition a year. So the conditions of the society or the economy have not, you know, were deteriorating or where were, debt was big. You can point to the things that we did to the debt. If you come to the last four years, we've gone from 14.5 billion average a year to 40 billion a year. So. What is the reason for that? The reason is very simple. The health of the economy is a problem. And the only way you can actually fix your fiscal is to increase the wealth of your citizens so that you can tax them. When you tax them, okay. you can pay down your fiscal. But we'll have time to talk about this, hopefully, in another program. Thank you for coming through. Uh, good luck with this. Jobs and prosperity for all. Kwame Wadako who is a, a, a former, he's one of the spokespersons on the manifesto. You are in charge of trade and what? Uh, it's trade industry and state-owned enterprises.
Thank you for being on the show. We wish you Thank well. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time, Bernard. That's all we have time for on the show yes. today. My name is Bernard Ablett. Thank you so much for watching. Stay with City TV. The Voters' Diary is next. The Point of View is powered by Airtel Tigo. Have you heard that Airtel Tigo calls from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. and Airtel Tigo money transfers are now free on new sims? Now you know. Airtel Tigo. Life is simple. And Lydia Contraceptive.